And today, I want us to consider the grace of thanksgiving during this most Christian of seasons. Uh, we, we often think of, uh, of Good Friday and Holy Week and the Passion and Palm Sunday and obviously Easter. But you don't have a resurrection without a death and you don't have a death without a life and you don't have a life without a birth. Hallelujah. And one of the things that has disturbed me, not about you guys, but more about me, is that this has been a season of incredible warfare in the church. This, this entire year. And sometimes the weight of it, the burden of it, becomes almost, almost uh, not debilitating, but, but, but it feels that way at some times. And I've been convicted because I, I feel like the Lord is challenging me, and, and hopefully prayerfully, not just me, but challenging us to kind of pivot a little bit in our prayer and in our intercession. Now, here's what I mean by that. I am grateful because I don't know that I've ever seen the body of Christ praying, not, not, not in this, this is a praying church, but, but globally, like it's been praying this year. I mean, every, every Tuesday afternoon, the Church of God in California and Nevada has a prayer meeting with the Church of God in Indonesia that you guys can all join online. If you just go to the California Nevada Church of God website or, or uh, Facebook, or I'll have us put one on our website that, that's a link to that. We have men and women around the globe who are praying together right now. They're praying for our election and the circumstances we're facing right now. They're praying for the pandemic and that. The, they're praying for uh, governments. They're praying for all sorts of things. And, and as I've shared with you, we're in a Daniel 10 season and a Matthew 10 season. We're in a, we're in a season where, where the, the spiritual warfare in the heavenlies is significant and it's the kind of warfare that changes nations. We're also in a, in a Matthew 10 season in the church where the Lord is calling the body of Christ to a level of commitment that, that, that is just foreign to most of us, candidly. You know, he's forming a remnant right now within the body of Christ. All that said, here's my conviction that the Lord has kind of dealt with me about. One of the barometers... One of the things that marks our faith as Christians is the core value of thanksgiving. The core value of giving praise and thanks and worship. And so when I say there's a subtle change that I'm, that I'm going to bring out today in our intercession, I'm not saying not to engage in spiritual warfare. We're engaged I'm not saying not to fast. We need to fast. I'm not saying not to press in in our commitment. We must press in in our commitment. But we must do these things with joy. We must do these things with thanksgiving. Because ours is a king who has already won the victory. Hallelujah. Ours is a God whose purposes will be fulfilled. Ours is the Lord, and he commands us to rejoice. In fact, a verse of scripture I want to draw your attention to, and it's in your, it's in your notes, and those of you that are watching online, it's, it's in our, uh, uh, on our webpage, and it's, it's also been, been posted there. But in 1 Thessalonians 5, the Apostle Paul says these words, Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything. Give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Say those first two words in verse 16 with me. Rejoice always. Hallelujah. That's not an emotion. That's not a, that's not a, a, a sense of, 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 of mind over matter. That's a command. Rejoice always. Always, and it is beneath the integrity of God to command you to do something you were not able to do. And it is beneath the integrity of God to command you to rejoice if you had nothing to rejoice over. Amen? So no matter what rages may come, no matter what battlefields we may fight on, 
no matter what pandemics may mask your face, no matter what economic uncertainty may come about, no matter what political uncertainty we may experience, no matter what the forces of hell might bring, we have Jesus. And therefore we must rejoice. We rejoice always because he commands it to us, because we can, and because we have reason to. Hallelujah. We have Jesus. And so part of rejoicing is in verse 18, in everything give thanks. So let us be thankful. Revival's coming. Let us be thankful. I don't know how long the window is yet. I'm, I'm, I'm waiting on the Lord to show some things, but the Lord is moving. We can be thankful because God has purposes in the earth. We can be thankful because every nation the Lord has design and purpose for. God is the one who raises up kingdoms. God is the one who raises up nations. God is the one who chooses, frankly, kings and presidents. He causes them to rise. He causes them to fall. He is the great God Almighty. But he partners with his people. So you and I have a say in the purposes of God being fulfilled in this nation. You and I have a say in the purposes of God being fulfilled in the nations. John Wesley said, God does nothing except in response to believing prayer. Dr. Jack Hayford said, his is the power, ours is the privilege. Without him, we cannot. Without us, he will not. And so the Lord has sovereignly decreed. Of course, he moves through angelic ministering spirits sometimes. And of course, he moves by his Holy Spirit all the time. But the fact of the matter is that most of the time, when it comes to God's intervention in the affairs of humanity, he does so through his people. I'll say that again. He does so through his people. That's why he would say things to us like, you're the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world. That's pretty significant stuff, my friends. You're the preservative and the protector of the earth. You're the illuminator and the exposing of the world. That's you and I, the church. We do it because we're part of the body of Christ. He's our head. We are the body. But he doesn't act. The head doesn't act without the body. I'll say that again. You need to get this so I can explain the message. The head doesn't act without the body. And so God has chosen that in the earth, he responds to our prayers. Your prayers are not religious ritual. Your prayers are not ceremonial utterings. Your prayers are moving the heavens. Hallelujah. Because God decreed it would be that way. When we go and evangelize, you know, you, you, you know, angels are going to be more scripturally precept than you and I, but they don't know what it is to be lost and then found. Hallelujah. So he uses us to be the presenters of his gospel. He uses us to share his good news. He uses us to be his hands extended to the poor and the needy. He uses us to be the feet of justice. He uses us to be the care for the innocent. He uses us to be the concerning ones for those who are wounded or those who cannot speak for themselves. This is the way of the kingdom. The king governs his kingdom through his people. And so you and I must pray, but we must pray his way. And so we rejoice always. We pray without ceasing. In everything we give thanks. Why? This is the will of God for us. So pray with me again. Let's pray for our nation. Let's pray for the nations of the earth. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray, Lord God, that you would destroy the dominion of darkness. We pray, Father God, that you would release your healing virtue in the nation and in the lands. We pray, Father God, that you would eradicate coronavirus. We pray, Father God, that you would eradicate the diseases of influenza and pneumonia and cancer and all these other things. Lord, we pray that we would enter into a season of healing and a season of health and a season of vibrancy. Father, we pray your kingdom come, your will be done in the earth, that, Father, in this 
this nation, in the circumstance we're walking in right now in our political situation, in the economic uncertainty, in the health uncertainty, in the overreach in many cases of governmental intrusion, in other places, Lord God, of wisdom and health. We pray, Lord, that your kingdom would reign and that your will would be done in the earth. And Father, we pray for your will to be done in the United States. And we pray, God, that the purposes you have for the nations of the earth would be fulfilled. Lord, you have a purpose for the United States. We pray that that purpose, though the enemy has tried to arrest it, though men have tried to corrupt it, we pray that your purposes for this land would come to pass. Not what corporate America says, not what political America says, not what media America says, not what big tech America says, not even what the religious America says. But Lord, let your edict for this land come to pass. In Jesus' name. And Father, we pray the same thing for the nations of the earth. We pray for China. We pray for the Asian nations. We pray, Father God, for Australia and the, and the South Pacific nations. We pray for Africa and the nations thereof. We pray for the Middle East nations and specifically the 1040 window to come under the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray for the European nations. Father, we pray for the Americas. We pray for North America, South America, and all the nations therein. Oh, Lord, let the glory of the Lord fill the earth like the waters cover the sea. Oh, God, let us enter a season of revival. Let us enter a season of reformation. Let us enter a season of a great awakening that covers the globe unlike anything we've ever known or has ever been done. You are the king, and you love, the, you love, you love, you love the people of the earth. Oh, Lord, let us have an ear that hears. Let us have a heart that obeys. And let us be swift to be about your work. In Jesus' holy name. And all who agreed said together, amen and amen. Praise God. Turn with me in the scripture to the 17th chapter of the Gospel of Luke. You know, thanksgiving is not just a behavior to be upheld by being polite. It is a spiritual barometer of one's heart. I'm going to say that again. Thanksgiving is a spiritual barometer of one's heart. In Luke, we have the story of our Savior's grace and his shock at the limited thanksgiving that was offered. This week, our nation paused to celebrate Thanksgiving, and I thank the Lord for that. Unfortunately, like many traditions, we have forgotten the reasons for the holiday. You see, my friends, Thanksgiving and Christmas, this entire season that we began today, we're culminating Thanksgiving weekend and we've begun the Christmas season. The world's going to celebrate it one way, and, and that's, that's, that's the world. They're lost. But you and I need to understand that this is a holy season. Even in, the, even in the Jewish community, there's the celebration of Hanukkah. All of these great holidays speak to the miraculous power of God. They speak to divine intercept that God has invested and intercepted in the ways of humanity, ultimately in the Messiah himself, the Lord Jesus. And the church should approach this season not just with, with, with a, a cavalier attitude. And to be candid, the world cannot and must not govern how we celebrate our king. He is our king. And frankly, he set the protocols of how we'll, go, of how we'll worship him. And we're going to worship him accordingly. As I said, we're not canceling anything. We're going to reimagine everything. But we're going to celebrate the goodness of the Lord. We're going to celebrate the king of kings. We're going to give thanks. And we're going to honor the birth of our Savior. In Luke 17, 
It says that now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. We don't have time today, but some of you may want to do some research into this. It is incredible how often the Lord built bridges between ethnic communities and built bridges between political rivalries. Neither Samaria or Galilee was considered to be a good place if you lived in Jerusalem. Because elitism isn't a new thing. Jesus comes from Galilee, and when he travels about, he's going to make sure he goes into Samaria or near Samaria, where a good Jew at that time would not even set foot in Samaria. He would walk all the way around it. Not our Savior. Because he came not just for the Jews, of course he's the Jewish Messiah, but he came for all of us. And aren't you thankful for that? Hallelujah. So verse 12 continues. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him, and they stood at a distance. Now the reason they stood at a, dis at a distance is they had to stand at a distance. That was more social distancing than anything you and I have experienced even th this year. If you had a, a leprosy, you were diagnosed by the priest. And the priest would look at his skin, maybe a rash or, or something that got worse, and, and he would grade it, and he would say if you had leprosy, and he would give the, the protocols and the procedures according to what, what the ailment was. So he pronounced that you actually had leprosy. Well, if you had a, a, a case of leprosy that was severe, in, in this case, you had to be separated from your home, you had to be separated from the community, you had to be separated from the synagogue, you had no interaction with anyone. You were completely isolated. The only people you could hang out with were people like you, thus these ten individual men, and you had no, no connection with the temple, no connection with God. You had no means of, 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 uh, of uh, producing a livelihood. You depended upon others. And you had not only the, the, um, the estrangement from society, but you were looked upon by society as having done something that caused your leprosy. So it was not only you have a disease, but it's your fault. And so this was the theology of the day. And so they stood at a distance because they had to stand at a distance. Now in the fifth chapter of Luke, we have the story of one man who actually comes up to Jesus and says, Lord, if you're willing, you can cleanse me. And the Lord says to him, I'm willing and touches the man. Not only a faux pas, but something that just wasn't done. And the man was instantly healed. But in this case, and I want you to get the narrative in your mind, the disciples are moving about, they're going about to enter, they're entering in this village, and these ten are standing at a distance. And the Bible says, in verse number 13, they called out in a loud voice. Would you please um, circle that phrase in your notes? In a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. Isn't it interesting how desperate people are rarely polite? And isn't it sad how polite we want desperate people to be? Have pity on us. When he saw them, now I want you to see this. When he saw them, he said, go. Go, show yourselves to the priests. Now think about this for a minute, my friends. He didn't heal them. He didn't touch them. He didn't move toward them. He didn't invite them closer to him. In fact, they could have taken what he was saying as rejection. Go, show yourselves to the priests. Don't bother me, go to the priest. Don't come to me, go to the priest. 
He could have been, it could have been misinterpreted as the Lord was rejecting these men in their moment of desperation. Lord, have pity on us. How many times have we cried out in desperation, Lord, have mercy in my life, have pity upon me. And the response of the Lord, because we don't understand it, we don't do it. These men, to their credit, did exactly what the Lord told them to do. Go show yourself to the priests, and guess what they did? They went. Because faith is an action based upon a belief supported by confidence. The Lord did not heal them and then send them to the priest. The Lord told them to go, and verse, the verse continues and says, And as they went, they were cleansed. As they went, they were cleansed. They were acting upon, in verse 14, they were acting upon the promises of God. I want you in the house to turn with me to, to Hebrews 11. I apologize. It's not in your notes. I should have put it in your notes, but I didn't. And Brother Tom, I apologize to you, but he's going to try to catch up with us. But in Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 1, Paul is talking about faith. And I want to go quickly through here. Wow, you guys, you have no idea how, what a blessing Tom is in there. He put even candles on the slide. I mean, that's just amazing. All right. Thank you, Tom. Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. I want you to think about that. It is confidence in what I don't have, and it's assurance as though I had it. Think about it. That's what, that's what faith is. Faith is I'm as confident for something I don't have as though I had it. And I'm assured about something I do not see as though I saw it. That's what these men were doing. They were confident in the word of the Lord. They were confident and, uh, and walked in the word of the Lord. Faith is an action based upon a belief, supported by confidence, it's trust. Are you tracking with me? So sometimes the confidence in the word of the Lord and sometimes the power of faith is that what you're hoping for, you get in the manner in which you hoped for it. Verse 6 of Hebrews 11. It says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Now, Tom, we're going to go to verse 32. But between verse 6 and verse 32, the writer of the Hebrew letter says that there, he talks about Noah. He talks about Enoch. He talks about Abraham. He talks about Isaac. He talks about Jacob. He talks about Joseph. He talks about Moses' parents. He talks about Moses. He talks about the children of Israel crossing the sea. He talks about the walls of Jericho falling. And then in verse number 32, he says, And what more shall I say? I, I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and all the prophets. Through faith. Everybody say faith. faith. Conquered kingdoms. Administered justice. Gained what was promised, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of flames, escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, who became powerful, hallelujah, in battle and routed foreign enemies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again, hallelujah. We all like that kind of faith. But look what he says. Others, everybody say others. Others were tortured, refused to be released so that they might gain a better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging while still others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned. They were sawed in two. They were put to death by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith. Yet none of them received what had been promised. Because God had planned something better for us. So that only together with us would they be made perfect or complete. 
Here's what I want you to see. God never does just one thing. And so when God is working in your life and when he's working in my life, when he's working in our life, he's working in our life, not just for us, but for the benefit maybe of your children or of your grandchildren or maybe of your neighbor or maybe of someone who's watching your life or maybe of a member of the church or he's working in the church for the benefit of a nation. Think about this. Do you think the apostles were men of faith? Of course they were. They're men of great faith. Eleven of the twelve died horrific deaths. Eleven of the twelve died the deaths of martyrs, and they weren't just casual deaths. They were horrific deaths. But it is in their dying in their faith that is part of the veracity that proves the truthfulness of their message that Jesus lives, that Jesus is alive. That it wasn't a conspiracy. It wasn't a lie. The thief, they didn't steal the body. They didn't fake his death. They didn't fake his burial. They didn't fake his resurrection. Because conspiracies unravel when there's any kind of pressure. But not just one, not just two, but 11 of the 12 died horrific deaths because their faith in living and dying secured our faith 2,000 years later. Do you see how that works? So faith is to trust God regardless of the circumstances. Faith is to trust God regardless of the outcome. Faith is to trust God regardless of whether I got the promise the way I wanted the promise. Faith is to say rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks because this is the will of God for you. The outcomes are his. The faithfulness is ours. That's good preaching. You need to get that. Amen. So let's get back to the text in Luke 17. The disciples, or the, 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 rather the ten, are, 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 are touched of God. They go, by the, they go in command of the Lord. They go on the promise of Jesus. They call out to the Lord, have pity on us. And as they went, they're cleansed. Verse number 15 says this then. One of them. And Andre Crouch wrote a beautiful song about this story called Take a Little Time. He says, one of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. I'm going to get to that in a moment. But can you imagine, and this is what uh, Andre pointed out in his song. Can you imagine that as these ten are walking, as these ten are moving, at some point, these broken down legs and these limbs, maybe that had been deteriorated, flesh that had gone away, appendages that had been removed, suddenly started growing an arm suddenly started growing a feet, foot. Suddenly they weren't hobbling. Suddenly they were walking with strength. Suddenly they were doing all the things that they used to be able to do. Suddenly they were restored to life and health and victory. And all of a sudden, all ten who walked on faith were cleansed. Glory to God. Jesus told them to go to the priests. We don't know if the one that came back didn't go. Because they couldn't have gotten restored to society. Because again, Jesus never does just one thing. He's not just going to heal their body. He's going to restore them into their culture. Okay? Because they're going to be salt and light in that culture. Jesus doesn't just save you and then take you to heaven immediately. We don't have a bunch of mini raptures that happen. He saves you and then he sends you to restore your culture. To restore who you are. Now think about this. One, though. And we find out he's a Samaritan. One has to go back. He has to go back. He has to go and find Jesus. We don't know from the text if he went to the priest or stopped on the way back. We don't know. But what we do know is that he had to go back and find Jesus. Oh, my friends, look what else it says in, in our text. He came back and he threw himself at the feet of Jesus and he thanked him. Everybody say he thanked him. He thanked him. But he didn't just thank him with a thank you, kind sir, for this noble deed that you have done for me. The Bible says in verse number 15 that he thanked him in a loud voice. In verse number 13, they asked, they cried out in a loud voice for pity. And in verse number 15, he came back and he thanked God 
in a loud voice because of his favor. Oh, my friends, have you ever noticed that sometimes they think and people think that you are undignified if you worship the Lord with any kind of fervor or any kind of passion or any kind of noise? Oh, church, quit allowing the culture to define how you worship God. Quit allowing the world to define how you're going to praise God. If you're going to cry out for your need in a loud voice, then the least you can do is give thanks for his salvation in a loud voice. <laughs> Hallelujah. I mean, I'm not quiet. I'm quiet a lot of the times, but I'm not quiet. I know, I know I'm in Warriors country, but when the Lakers, who happen to win the championship this year, when they win, I, I tend to get loud. I'll even applaud and get loud when something that I, 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 I don't have a vested interest in. But it'll move me. I'm not a musician. I'm not a singer. I, and so whenever I, I, I see someone that plays an instrument and it's beautiful and it's elegant and it's eloquent, I want to celebrate. And if it really moves me, I'll stand up. And I have no problem with a, with a little bravo or whoop whoop or great job. How much more the king of kings who gave his life for you? How much more the Lord who gave his life for me? How much more the God of gods who gave us salvation, who purchased our life from the pit, who taken us from the miry clay, who put our feet in heaven, who gave us the glory of the Lord? How much more should we not offer him a praise that is boastful and loud and even braggadocious? That's Hallel praise. You like that word. You like the word hallelujah. You just don't want to do the word hallelujah. We like hallelujah. That's not the word. Praise that is Hallel praise is noisy praise. It is boastful praise. It is braggadocious praise. It is party praise. It is warfare praise. It is the kind of praise that causes the enemy's camp to tremble in fear because somebody believes the promise of God is real. Raise a hallelujah. Raise a hallelujah. Raise a hallelujah in the face of the enemy. Oh, the world's trying to do everything to keep you quiet, to keep you in your little place, to keep you how you're going to do this and how you're going to do that. And I know they have every kind of rationale and thought, some of which I agree with, some of which I don't agree with. But my friends, I will not allow someone out there to define how the Lord is going to be worshipped in my heart and in my life and in my ministry and in your ministry. We will praise the Lord and I want the enemy's camp to hear about us. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Somebody turned to your neighbor. He's only got one day to finish a Thanksgiving sermon. So we've got to get on with this. Whenever we forget the purposes of God's blessing in our lives, our heart grows cold. Whenever we forget the goodness and the purposes of God's blessing in our lives, our heart grows cold. When a nation forgets, because the people of God do not keep it in front of the nation, the purposes and blessings of God for our lives, our heart grows cold. God raises nations for his purposes. You don't have to be a Phi Beta Kappa in history or spiritual mapping to understand why the United States exists. God created a nation of nations. There's only one group here that is Native Americans. Everyone else came from somewhere else. We are a nation of nations. Some came by criminal activity through slavery. Some came because they wanted wealth and dominion and power. 
Some came by exploitative and for exploitative purposes. None of those things change the fact that God has sovereign purpose. And when a nation, albeit the world and the system, always try to corrupt the purposes of God. Think about it. Satan always tries to counterfeit, corrupt, and, and, and violate God's purposes. He does that in your life. I mean, think about how many great entertainers God had actually called into his house, but instead they went that way. Think about how many great leaders God called in his service, but they went into politics instead. Now, don't get me wrong. We need great Christian leaders in politics. I'm not suggesting otherwise. But think about how many times we have taken the blessing and the benefit of God in our own life and used them for our own selfish ways. God gave you a mind. God gave you ability. God gave you capacity. God gave you the ability to produce wealth. He says that in Deuteronomy. I've given you the ability to produce wealth. And yet we, we balk at even the, the most simplest of acts like tithing. Well, God gave you all that. You, you, you see where I'm going? So why did God prosper this nation? So that it could take the gospel to the nations. But, in, but instead, the corruption is we, we worship the prosperity. And a principality over America, one of them, is mammon. And God is challenging that principality this year. More so than you realize it. Because when you look at the underpinnings of, of an economy that is on, built on a credit card right now, that's not a good thing. That's not a good thing. Another thing that God gave us is strength. Security. But we took pride in our strength and pride in our security. And what the enemy tries to do is corrupt that so it's not just strength and security, but it's, but it's some kind of domination and that type of thing. But we need to be strong and we need to be prosperous, not because so we can have the things that we want, but so that God can do the things through us that he chose. Are you tracking with me? So what I want you to see is this. We have forgotten why we exist. And I shared about what I'm, what I'm about to share with you. I shared with the students at, at Pace last Friday, or a week ago Friday. I want you to hear some of this. A pastor, Robert Hunt, not an explorer, a pastor, led an exhibition in 1607. This is in your notes, and i got to hurry. Okay, in 1607, he led this exhibition 169 years before the nation existed. Here's what he said. We dedicate this land. We dedicate this land and ourselves to reach the people within these shores with the gospel of Jesus Christ and to raise up godly generations after us and with these generations to take the kingdom of God to all the earth. That's why it exists. We dedicate this land to that. Oh, others will come and corrupt it. Others will come and produce wickedness. Others will come and bring criminality and enslavement. But that's not God's purpose. God's purpose is that the kingdom would be extended through this nation. 1621, we know the story of the pilgrims. George Washington and other U.S. presidents continued to set aside a day of giving thanks. But it wasn't until 1863 that President Abraham Lincoln formalized a national holiday of thanksgiving at the height of the Civil War, in the middle of the bloodiest conflict in American history, in the middle of what Abraham Lincoln called the judgment of God upon America for the sin of slavery. That is when a president formalized Thanksgiving as a holy day. Not a priest, not a pastor, not a king. A president. And look what he said. The year that is drawn toward its close has been filled with the blessings of fruitful fields and healthful skies. They are the gracious gifts of the Most High God who while dealing with us in anger for our sins has nevertheless remembered mercy. You see what he's saying? We're going to give thanks. Our condition is because of our sin. 
Our, our wickedness has brought this terrible calamity. But that doesn't change the goodness and the mercy of God. It has seemed to me fit and proper that they should be solemnly, reverently, gratefully acknowledged as with one heart and voice by the whole of the American people. I do therefore invite my fellow citizens in every part of the United States to set apart and observe the last Thursday of November next as a day of thanksgiving and praise to our beneficent Father who dwells in the heavens. This was not a day for the pilgrims. This was not a day of prosperity. This was not a day of all those things. As good as all that was, the, the, the edict, the decree of thanksgiving was we as a nation are going to praise God. It's not about pumpkin pie and roasted turkey and football and anything else. We're going to stop and give thanks. <clears throat> How sad that the church has forgotten the value of thanksgiving. We're not to be grateful in good things only. We're to be grateful in all things because grace is sufficient and it is especially visible in the difficult. Thanksgiving is, according to the dictionary, the act of giving thanks. It is a prayer, a prayer, a prayer, a prayer expressing gratitude. It is a public acknowledgement or celebration of divine, divine, divine goodness. It is a Christian holiday. So three things I want to leave you with. Number one, thanksgiving is the cultivation of an attitude of gratitude. Thanksgiving is an attitude that must be cultivated. Believers must recognize, hear me church, that one of the essential keys and distinctive marks of the Christian faith is thankfulness. One of the evidences of the Spirit of God in your life is thankfulness. Paul told the Philippian believers to do all things without arguing or complaining. It is a barometer of your heart. It is the barometer of your soul. The ancient Roman philosopher Cicero even said, a thankful heart is not only the greatest virtue, but it is the parent of all other virtues. The more prideful you are, the more prideful I am about our good fortune. Or alternately, the more bitter we become over our misfortune, the less we will be able to express thanksgiving with any measure of authenticity. I'll say that in a simpler way. If, I am more, if I'm prideful of my blessings or I'm bitter over things that didn't go my way, I will be ungrateful. And Paul and the word of God is giving us a remedy to ungratefulness. I am blessed by God when things are going well and I am kept by God when things are going bad. Either way, God is working. Either way, God is moving. I will be grateful. This is why he would tell the Philippian believers from jail, rejoice in the Lord always. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, with thanksgiving, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends everything else, which transcends the circumstances, will guard your hearts. Number two in your notes. Gratitude is an attitude that must be cultivated, and thanksgiving is an expression of grace. It is, as I said earlier, the barometer of one's soul. Instead of the age of enlightenment, we have descended into an age of entitlement.
Instead of an age of enlightenment, in spite of all of our skill, in spite of all of our knowledge, in spite of all of our access to knowledge, we are no more enlightened. In fact, we have descended into a place of entitlement. The result of which is an ever-increasing level of cynicism, hard-heartedness, ungratefulness. The thankfulness of the children of God is a recognition of the grace of God in one's life. Not just when things go well, but especially when they don't. Again, in our text, in every situation, no matter what the circumstances, be thankful and continually give thanks to God. My friends, ungratefulness, ungratefulness is the great sin of our time. Ungratefulness is the great sin of our time. Just ask yourself, ask your own soul, do a bit of an assessment. How grateful am I? Do I pray with thanksgiving or do I pray with anxiety? Grace is not grace if I'm entitled to it. Mercy is not mercy if I'm entitled to it. Paul told the Roman church, no one has ever given God anything that God should pay him back. Lincoln created this holiday for the sole purpose of giving thanks. Even though it was a time of significant national tragedy and profound personal loss. Do you realize, my friends, that he had just lost his son? He was grieving the death of his child. His wife was overcome with grief and she was already, by today's standards, probably somewhat in, in, suffering some level of mental illness. Fighting a civil war. Fighting even those within his own party and the opposition party that were still part of the union. Trying not only to have the emancipation, which was an executive order, but trying to pass a constitutional amendment which would give permanent freedom. All of these battles were around this man. And in that moment of time, he said, we've got to give thanks. How's your heart? How's my heart? Do we feel entitled to the blessing of God? Do we feel entitled to the care of others? Do we feel entitled? Or do we recognize that God is good? And he is gracious. And his bounty is what blesses me. And his power is what keeps me. And the same God who allows the blessing allows the difficulty. Because there's something I can learn in the blessing. And there's something I can really learn in the difficulty. Finally. And I want to leave you with this. Thanksgiving is a gratitude attitude. It is an expression of grace, but it is the key to happiness. Thanksgiving is the key to happiness. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks. This is the will of God for you. You cannot have happiness without the will of God. Thanksgiving is the key. Now, it, it, it works itself in a, in, a, in a very interesting way, and I want you to follow with me as we cl conclude here. Today, our world tells us, in fact, our world tries to convince us that something external, something outside of you, is the key to your happiness. Oh, church, you got to get this. My friends, listen to me. The world is trying to convince you that something outside of you is what's really going to make you happy. The world is trying to tell you and sell you that if you just had a little more money or if you just had this label on your jacket or if you just carried that purse 
or if you just had this stock or this security, or if you just drove that car, or if you just lived in that house, or if that young man or that young woman finally paid attention to you, or if your team or your politician finally won, if something outside of you happened right, then you would be happy. That is a lie out of the pit of hell. The only thing that, that could remotely be considered outside of you that can happen inside of you that makes you happy is the Lord God himself. There is nothing this world has to offer that will bring you happiness. There is nothing this world has to offer that will bring you permanent joy. And the sadness is that the body of Christ continually is out there doing exactly what the world is doing, trying to find happiness, trying to find meaning, trying to find hope, trying to find joy everywhere but where God has said it is in Jesus Christ. The world is bent on destroying you. The kingdom of hell is bent on lying to you. Nehemiah said in Nehemiah 8.10, the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Why could Paul say that we have to uh, rejoice always? Because the joy of the Lord is your strength. Why must we rejoice in all things? Because the joy of the Lord is your strength. Why do we rejoice when things are well? Because that's your strength. Why do we rejoice when things aren't well? Because that's our strength. Hallelujah. Scientists have actually found, social scientists have actually found that people who are more grateful are actually happier. In other words, it isn't external happenings that makes a person thankful. It is internal gratitude that makes a person happy. I might even go so far as to say this. 39 years now in full-time pastoral ministry, I have never seen a grateful person who is perpetually unhappy. I have never seen a grateful person who is perpetually unhappy. And I've never seen a happy person who is perpetually ungrateful. I have seen both suffer great loss. I often have shared this before. I think of my dad. I think of the song we sang today about the goodness of God. My dad fought in a war. My dad lost his daughter, as obviously my mom did too. But every prayer my dad will offer that I ever hear him pray, he will always say, God, you have been so good to me. And I can honestly say, here my dad is failing in so many ways in terms of his physical health, but not his spirit. Not his spirit. Because grateful people know that it's not what's outside of them that's going to make them happy. Grateful people know that it is the grace and mercy of God and that doesn't go away. That doesn't run away when, it, when, when stocks go bad. That doesn't run away when the economy goes bad. That doesn't run away when the pandemics hit. That doesn't run away when the politicians do their silliness. That doesn't run away when corporations do their failings. That doesn't run away. The mercy and grace of God are never ending and never failing. And so I will rejoice. It doesn't mean that grateful people don't have days of difficulty or sorrow or grief. What it means is that they refuse to let the outside destroy the inside. It's the key to happiness because they refuse to let the outside destroy the inside. They know that their hope is in the Lord, therefore their trust is in the Lord. They know that God loves them and has his very best for them. They are grateful for God. And they find his blessings in the midst of everything. And therefore, they're happy. 
This is what Jesus meant when he said, I've told you this so that trusting me, you'll be unshakable and assured, deeply at peace. In this godless world, you'll have difficulties, but take heart, I've conquered the world. How's your heart today? Are you looking for something to happen to you that finally makes you happy? Or are you like the psalmist who said, the Lord is my strength. The Lord is my strength and my shield. I trust him with all my heart. He helps me and my heart is filled with joy. I burst out in songs of thanksgiving. I don't have songs of thanksgiving because I got a raise. I don't have songs of thanksgiving because I got something else. I'm grateful for those things. But I burst forth with songs of thanksgiving because the Lord is my strength and the Lord is my shield and I'm going to trust him. Hallelujah. In this season, this miraculous season of Thanksgiving through Christmas and even into the new year, church, would you please swim against the stream of this culture? Would you please raise a voice of Thanksgiving? Would you please shout hallelujah? Would you please say Merry Christmas? Would you please say thank God for his goodness? Would you please be salt and light in the earth? our season so I want us to pray and then we'll worship and I've gone a, I've gone a few minutes over today so I'm going to be not quick but I want you to hear me I want to try to be efficient I'm going to tell you how we're going to pray we're going to pray for those who need the Lord for salvation we're going to pray for healing but there are two things the Lord shared with me that we we're going to pray against and we have the authority remember that we have the authority we're in a spiritual fight right now we're going to pray against a, a, a spirit, a calamity of, the, of darkness that has come against people, and it's a spirit of fear. Remember, we've talked about don't be afraid this whole season. And every time the Lord shows up, he says, do not be afraid, do not be afraid, do not be afraid. Well, we're going to come against that spirit of fear that's tormenting some of you. And that spirit of fear has caused a place of despair and a place of depression. Now, there are medical and psychological reasons for depression at times. And, and that I'm going to pray for healing. But just like the man, son, and Mark 9 that we've been talking about, sometimes it's an affliction. Sometimes it's the enemy. And the enemy has used fear to bring about a calamitous depression over the land. You see it. People are angry. People are afraid. They hide. They cower. This is not humanity as God intended it. We're going to come against those things. And we're going to break that in the name of Jesus. And here's what we're going to replace it with. Remember, Jesus said, you, you don't just deal with the spirit because it'll go and find the place swept and unclean. And the, the second state will be worse than the previous state. We're going to fill it. And here's how we're going to fill it. We're going to ask the Lord to release a grace of thanksgiving over the land. A grace of thanksgiving over the land. That the Lord would cause the people of God, that's where it starts, to just be more worshipful than we've ever been. Even in our warfare intercession, we're going to give thanks. So with every head bowed for a moment in this house, and while you that are online are watching, if you need Jesus as your Savior, in the authority of the Word of God, my friends, repent. Turn your life to the Lord. And if you're in this house and you want to receive Jesus as your Savior, would you please hold your hand up and I'll pray with you right where you are. You say, I don't know Christ, but I want to give him my life today. Maybe you've thought about him. Maybe you've kind of circled around him. But now is the day. Now is the time for you to surrender. And if you're watching online and that's you, I want you to push that button that's coming up on your screen so we can pray together and send you some follow-up materials to help you grow. But we're going to pray right now. So church, pray this with me. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I surrender my life to the rule of Jesus Christ. Thank you, God, for sending your son. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for dying on the cross. 
I'm grateful what you did for me. And I'm grateful that you've risen from the dead so that I can be saved. And I call upon you today and I thank you for saving my life in Jesus' name. If you need healing in your body now, would you just lay your hand on that general area of your body? Or someone that you love needs healing in their body, just lay your hand as a point of contact on that part of, their, uh, uh, of your body, but you're praying for them. So Father, we pray for healing in the name of Jesus. We pray for conditions that have been chronic to be resolved and, and, and remedied. We pray for hurt and anguish and sorrow and aggravations, Lord God. We pray for the frustration and the emotional disconnect that is taking place. We pray for healing of depression. We pray for healing of anxiety. We pray for healing of these things. We pray, Lord God, that, that hearts would go in order, that lungs would go in order, that livers would go in order, that vital organs, pancreatic cancer would be healed in Jesus' name. And Lord God, that you would just do miracles and, and, and Lord, let the miracle flow of grace touch the lives of your people. In Jesus' name. Now church, join with me in agreement. The Lord said where two or three of us agree that it'll be done. And so we're going to pray against this fear and this depression. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come on your authority and the authority of your son. Your word says in Ephesians that all things are under his feet and all things are under our feet. You've given us the authority and to, to bind and to loose. And so in the name of Jesus, we know that fear is not your will. We know that fear is not your will. We know that the enemy propagates fear and moves in fear. We come against the spirit of fear that has been released in the church and the spirit of fear that has been released in the nation and in the nations of the earth. Oh Lord, we want wisdom. We want, we want uh, even handedness. We want, we want adult sensitivity, but we will not be governed by fear. And in the name of Jesus, we come against that and take authority over it and we cast it down. You have no right here in Jesus' name. And Father, we come against that spirit of depression, isolation, anguish, sorrow, hopelessness, rejection. In Jesus' name, we break its power. We break its lie over people's lives. In the name of Jesus, we break its whisper in the night. We break its devastation in the night. In Jesus' name, let the joy of the Lord become their strength. Let the power of grace become their hope. Let the sufficiency of mercy become their lifeline. Oh, Lord, release a spirit of thanksgiving in our land. Release a spirit of thanksgiving in the nations. Release a spirit of worship in the house of God. Oh Lord, we will rejoice in God our Savior. Bless you, Lord. We know what's going on. But greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. We praise you, Father, in Jesus' name. In the house, if you would stand with me. Wherever you are, if you wouldn't mind just raising your hands to the Lord and let's just thank him. Lord, we love you. We thank you so much for your goodness. We thank you so much for your mercy and your grace, your kindness and your generosity. Father, touch your people now. May they go with singing. May they go with hopefulness. May they go with joy. May they go with thanksgiving. May the joy of the Lord be their strength. Hallelujah. And we worship you, most high God in Jesus' name. And we praise you, Father. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah.